Good evening, everyone. I'm Paulette Patterson Dilworth, Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you for, for joining us for this very exciting and timely conversation on race with Dr. Beverly Tatum. But before I introduce Dr. Tatum and our host, Dr. Thomas, I'd like to pause to recognize our, our UAB's partners and our co-sponsors for this evening. Our UAB partners include the Student Multicultural Programs and Services Office with the Division of Student Affairs, the UAB Department of Psychology, our partner institutions, University of Alabama at Tuscaloosa, University of Alabama at Huntsville, Sanford University Office of Diversity and Inclusion, and Viva Health. We thank you for answering our call to support this event. Um, Dr. Tatum is a psychologist and educator who has conducted research and written acclaimed books, including Assimilation Blues, Black Families and a White Community Who Succeed and Why, Can We Talk About Race and Other Conversations in an Era of School Resegregation, and Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria and Other Conversations About Race, the latter of which was named the 1998 Multicultural Book of the Year by the National Association of Multicultural Education. Her writing focuses specifically on race in education, racial identity development in teenagers and assimilation of black families and youth in white neighborhoods. Her impressive academic career has included both faculty and administrative appointments. From 2000 until her retirement in 2015, Dr. Tatum served as president of Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia. Our host for the evening, Dr. Keisha Thomas, is named Dean of the University of Alabama College of Arts and Sciences following a national search. She has been with us now for two months. She started her tenure here, August 1st, 2020. Dr. Thomas joins UAB from the University of Georgia where she was Senior Associate Dean in the Franklin College of Arts and Sciences. In her role there, Dr. Thomas was Division Dean for the Social and Behavioral Sciences and also managed the college's faculty affairs functions, its diversity and inclusion strategy, and was a liaison to the Faculty Senate. Dr. Thomas, who began her 27-year tenure at UAG, UGA as a professor of industrial organizational psychology and African-American studies, is the founding director of the Center for Research and Engagement in Diversity a program of the Franklin College. So without further ado, I'd like to give you our host, Dr. Keisha Thomas. Thank you and welcome to both of you. Thank you, Dr. Dilworth. And uh, thank you to UAB for the very warm welcome and for this incredible opportunity to speak to, I think many psychologists uh, consider you, Dr. Tatum, um, a hero, a shero. Um, so I feel very honored um, and grateful to spend this time with you. So thank you for coming and joining us at UAB. Oh, it's certainly my pleasure and I look forward to our conversation. Yes, wonderful. So, you know, I've mentioned to you, um, I've used Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria uh, for a number of classes, a freshman class on Can We Talk About Race, um, a graduate class, on racial identity development, but even more recently in a leadership book club um, at the University of Georgia. And um, if we were to go back to the time in which you were writing, um, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? What was going on in the late 90s? You know, what really kind of motivated you to start on this path? Well, thank you for that question. You know, if we rewind back to, let's say, 1995, I was at that time a professor of psychology in Massachusetts. I was teaching at Mount Holyoke College, and I had been teaching a course on the psychology of racism for about 15 years. And one of the things that I'd learned in that 15-year period was that a lot of my students were coming to my course as juniors or seniors in college without really ever having had the opportunity to have these conversations. And they would say to me, why is it that I graduated from high school without ever having a conversation? How come we weren't talking about this in my high school or even in my middle school? And I started asking 
teachers, K through 12 teachers, about why that was the case. Why weren't they teaching about social issues like racism in the schools? And most of them said, because I don't really know how to approach the subject. I'm, I'm nervous about it. And I started to do workshops with teachers, sharing what I'd learned in my teaching experience over those 15 years. And the teachers said, you know, this is great, but really it would be helpful if the principals of our school were getting this information because I need the support of the principal to really be able to do this work. So I, I had the opportunity to do workshops with principals. And then the principal said, you know, this is really helpful, but it's the school superintendents. If we only had school superintendents on board, that would make all the difference. And I started doing workshops with school superintendents. And then the school superintendent said, you know, it's really my school board. I need the people on my school board to really understand these are important issues. And so would you come to our town and do a workshop with all the teachers and the principals and school board members? And I started doing some of that, but I found myself really wearing myself out. <laughs> you know, it was just too much to do and have a full-time job and trying to raise two kids and be, you know, a thoughtful wife. And all of those things um, led me to say to myself, you know, you really need to put in writing some of what you've been talking about. So that's what led me to write my book in the first place, the idea of being able to share this information with a wider audience who could perhaps read it and talk about it in a book club, but not require my presence. <laughs> and so um, that's what prompted me to do that. But it's also important to say, coincidentally, I didn't know this would be the case, but the year my book came out in the fall of 1997, was also the same year that Bill Clinton, who was president at the time, launched what he called his presidential initiative on race. Many people don't remember that he had such an initiative. It kind of got buried in other news that was going on at that time. But one of the things he said back in 1997 is that because we are a nation at peace and we're experiencing prosperity, now would be a good time for us to really take on the tough issue of looking at the legacy of race and racism in our society, to try to really heal our nation in this way. And I think it was a great idea to try. Um, unfortunately, he wasn't able to focus on it because of other things that happened in his administration. But it does remind us that after his tenure as president in 2001, 9-11 uh, happened, and then we weren't a nation at peace. We were very much feeling under attack and the economy collapsed in 2008. And certainly right now people are feeling a lot of economic anxiety. So it makes it harder sometimes to have these conversations when other things are not going well, but that's what was going on in 1997. Well, and that's, a really interesting kind of perspective about the time period from the perspective of President Clinton, that things yes. are good. So now we can take on this really challenging issue that we try to avoid at all costs <laughs> and not really have it take, take off. But yet here we are in 2020 and we're riding the Corona coaster, as I like to call <laughs> it. Um, and we're dealing, you know, a lot of people are calling this year a year of racial reckoning, um, which really seemed to be kind of initiated with the murder of George Floyd. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I do wonder if it's this level of crisis that has made um, having difficult conversations around race just really critical. Like, you know, I, I feel a sense that people aren't willing to silence themselves in the way that they may have in the past in order to keep the peace and um, build up systems of comfort, you know, so that everyone can continue on doing their jobs, living in their neighborhoods. Um, could you speak to that a little bit? You know, is yes. it really, do we need to be motivated by these crises in order to take issues like race, gender, sexuality, gun violence, you know, do in order to take those things seriously? Well, you know, I do think that there is something particular about this moment. And I think it does have something to do with the corona 
virus pandemic. Because if we go back to that day in May when George Floyd was murdered, one of the things that we can say about that, two things that are probably important. One was it was captured on video, right? That cell phone uh, video was so clear. And um, so sometimes, you know, the video is not clear. Sometimes it's questionable. What are you looking at? And, you know, well-intentioned people can have different interpretations of what they've seen, but it was so unquestionable what was right. happening there. And, you know, for more than eight minutes, almost nine minutes of uninterrupted imagery as, you know, this man was having the life snuffed out of him and, and people were at home. They weren't at work and they might've been working but they were working from home. And so had easy access to their phones or their computer screens or breaking news on the radio or the television. And so it was hard to ignore. You know, sometimes things happen and we're just busy and we didn't hear about it. We didn't know about it, didn't see the paper that day. But in this case, so many people could see and could not deny that something bad was being done to this black man that we have never seen done to a white person. You know, I mean, some people might say, well, why did, you know, what makes you think it was because he was black? Well, um, there, it happens so frequently and it never, you know, when was the last time you saw a white person pinned to the ground like that? Right. You know, it doesn't happen to white people. We know that, not in that, with that frequency or with that lethality. We are more often seeing you know, white people being talked down, not escalated. Um, and so I think it just touched a chord of empathy for people mm -hmm. to see this person calling for his mother as he lay dying. You know, um, it was just painful to watch and um, hard to ignore. So I, I do think that it triggered something in many people to say, this is wrong, I have to speak up. Yeah, and you know what always um, confounds me and to some extent is that it took that level of violence yes. for many people to actually kind of hear the African American community and to kind of validate yes. the um, complaints that have been you know made over years. Yes. Um, and you know I think you're right. It's the quality of the video. It wasn't only on George Floyd, it was on the entire setting. There was yes. a group there pleading on his behalf. Yes. But I think what was also unique is that we saw the police officers. We saw yes. their faces. We saw indifference yes. um, in regards to his pleas for his mother, as well as the pleas of the crowd. And the fact that um, the video itself was taken by a child, yes. right? And the, you know, the trauma um, that all of those people experience, but also the, the trauma of this young woman. So, you, you know, you bring up an, an issue around resistance um, that, you know, I, I would imagine that you know, those years that you spent uh, training teachers and principals and superintendents and community members, that many people probably pushed back to some extent and said, you know, you're, you're blowing this out of proportion you know, you're overly sensitive, you know, this doesn't happen all that frequently. Yeah. Uh, but in the face of George Floyd, you know, the resistance <laughs> starts to lose its weight. Mm -hmm. You know, what are the, the forms of resistance that you had to confront as you were kind of building up this body of scholarship around racial identity development? Well, I think you have, um, in your comment, hit a nail on the head, which is, you know, it does, there's a tendency sometimes to see individual instances as just that, an individual instance of someone behaving badly. You know, someone right. is, um, uh, and not seeing it as part of a systemic pattern. Um, and that reluctance to see the pattern is understandable in part because many of us grow up with the idea that we live in a fair society, 
right? Mm -hmm. That we live in a meritocracy. When I was teaching, one of the ideas that I found many of my students came into my class with was the idea that people get what they deserve. Yes, a just and, world. Yes, we live in a just world. And of course, we would all like to think that is true, but we know that, you know, bad things happen to good people. Um, and, uh, and it's not necessarily that someone has been, that someone deserves something bad to happen to them. You know, George Floyd didn't deserve to be treated in that way. Um, even if he had committed a crime, he still didn't deserve to be treated right. in that way. Um, but the idea that, you know, if I work hard and do the right thing, I will be justly rewarded for my mm -hmm. efforts and that everyone else will be rewarded in the same way that I'm being rewarded. The idea that some people won't be rewarded because of discrimination or won't get the same reward because perhaps of wage discrimination or employment discrimination, won't have the same access to opportunities, won't be able to get the loan at the bank because of redlining, won't be able to um, have access to healthcare because of the way healthcare is distributed and the ways in which um, marginalized communities are, um, have limited access. So, you know, there's, as we see, playing itself out relative to this pandemic. So that idea that there are systems that are have been in place long before any of us showed up. I mean, I think that's part of it too. It's like, if, you, if I understand this as a system, then my students would say, am I to blame for it? And what I think is important for all of us to understand is that none of us alive today is to blame for its creation. But we all have a responsibility to interrupt the process so it doesn't continue. You know, sometimes I talk about um, racial prejudices and stereotypes as being like smog in the air. And if we think about air pollution, you know, no one of us is responsible for air pollution, but we all contribute to it in some ways. Uh, and we all have a responsibility to take action to clean it up if indeed we want clean air. If we want to interrupt the cycle of racism, we all have to take responsibility for interrupting it. Right. So I also used to teach a class sim similar to yours, the psychology of prejudice. Uh -huh. And ultimately, by the last two weeks or so of the semester, students would kind of throw up their hands and be like, well, you know, now I see these things everywhere. Yes. You know, when I'm watching a movie, when I'm having conversations over Thanksgiving, you know, you know, these stereotypes and caricatures of, you know, who we are, especially as people of color are embedded in so much of our media. And so sometimes students would feel helpless in the face of the strengths and, you know, history of these systems. And so, you know, more recently, I've started to think more about what does it mean to be an ally? Um, if you are not a person of color, if you are a man, if you are straight, middle class, able body, what does ally behavior look like in the face of all of us breathing the same contaminated air, right? Um, and I think, you know, some allies are the people who will pull you aside after the meeting and say, oh, you know, I can't believe the way that person spoke to you. Um, but other allies are people who are going to disrupt the meeting and um, not, not wait for a signal, but take it upon themselves to speak up, you know, for me, let's say as a woman of color, even if I'm not there. Yeah. So, you know, in your kind of experience doing this training, especially, what, are, what have you learned about um, developing allies? Well, the first thing I think I would say in response to your question is helping people who would be allies recognize that action is required, right? So I, I, I sometimes use this analogy, it's in my book, where I talk about racism as being like the moving walkway at the airport. You know, so let me just explain that analogy for a mm -hmm. moment. Um, let's imagine we're at the airport and, you know, you step onto that moving walkway that's going to carry you from terminal A to terminal B. And, and, and 
you can just stand there. Um, and if we think about the walkway as being like all those systems, those policies, those practices that keep the system of racism running in our society, um, you don't have to do anything. You can just stand still, but you'll still be carried along in the direction where that those systems mm -hmm. and policies and practices are taking you. Some people will be very energetically walking fast on that moving walkway. We might think of those people as the people who are actively embracing racist ideologies, racist stereotypes, actively perpetuating them. But there are other people who don't embrace those things, don't like those ideas, but are standing still. And because they're standing still, they're still being carried along. Right. There are other people who will say, I don't like what I see. I don't want to go where this is headed. I'm going to turn around. But they don't move. They just turn around. And so, <laughs> um, so now they're still traveling, but they're yeah. traveling backwards. And they don't see where they're going. But they're still headed in that same direction. It's only when you turn around and walk quickly in the opposite direction that you can interrupt this process. And so if we think about allies as those people who are willing not just to say, I don't wanna go where this is headed, but people who are willing to turn around and take action to quickly move in the opposite direction, um, that that's where you start to see social change. So it's the person who you know might decide, as you said, to speak up even if you're not in the room. You know, There's some people who will speak up if you're in the room to say right. you know, that, that was inappropriate. I don't think we should, you know, do that policy. I don't think, you know, what you said, what you just said, um, was offensive to me and my colleague Keisha or Beverly. Um, but if you're not in the room, the person who says, "Let's look at our policies and our practices. Who's being left out? Who is being um, given?" is being overrepresented by what we're trying to do? Who's being underrepresented? How, what can we do to bring more voices to the table? The person who is consistently doing that, no matter who's in the room, is the real interrupter of that cycle. That's great. And I love the metaphor about the you know, moving walkway because you're right, you know, to turn around and then get off is also uncomfortable. Yes. You know, the, the privilege of going with the flow and still getting to where you want to go um, is easy. It's comfortable, we're used to it, it's the status quo, but to make that decision to turn around and jump off or, or run off, is gonna be uncomfortable, it's gonna make you vulnerable, people are gonna look at you, they're gonna wonder about your motivations. Um, and all of that, I think, is involved with being a good ally. And sometimes Absolutely. just kind of going it alone. So you are the queen of metaphors, Dr. Tatum. <laughs> you really are. And so I want to go back because I feel like I've gotten ahead of myself and go back to the big metaphor, and that is the cafeteria table, yeah. which I love. And, you know, as we've been talking about, a lot of people are uncomfortable around conversations as they relate to race and to even bring up the fact that in 2020 in K through 12 and higher ed in corporate America, there are still cafeteria tables where groups gather to be around others like themselves. You know, some people see that as problematic. Um, can you just talk about that a little bit more? Is it a problem? Is it good? Is it bad? Should we break up? Should we remove the table? <laughs> well, I think the first thing we want to acknowledge is that we all seek out people with whom we have shared experiences, right? You know, that's part of human nature. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna look for people who I feel I have something in common with, with whom I have a sense of home and comfort. You know, if we were um, visiting a foreign country where English was not the primary language and found ourselves in a social event where there were a group of English speakers I can guarantee we'd all be standing together. Those English speakers would all be standing right. together because we would have this thing in common and we would feel it would be a source of bonding. Um, and so there's nothing wrong with connecting with people with whom you have a shared experience or a sense of commonality. But 
we also know that when we talk about um, the racial groups, whether that's um, the white kids at the table, the black kids at the table, I mean, and it's people always ask why are the black kids, but they tend to overlook the fact that they're surrounded by white tables, right? So um, what we know is that segregation, the pattern of segregation that has been long established going back now hundreds of years um, is a pattern that is not only about people choosing to be with each other, but it's also rooted in a pattern of exclusion. And it's also rooted in um, a pattern of responding to a hostile environment. And by mm -hmm. hostile, I don't necessarily mean, I mean, it could be very hostile. It could be where you're being called names and it could be where you are um, you know, being mistreated and therefore you gather together with folks with whom you find safety. But even if it's not hostile in that sense, there may be a sense in which I don't feel seen, heard, or understood. You know, people might want, um, I, I'm, I'm gonna put it like this. When you're eating in that cafeteria, you're having an opportunity to connect with people with whom you have some shared experience and can find psychological comfort and recharge. Nothing wrong with recharging. And in fact, there's some evidence that suggests that when those spaces exist in colleges and universities, whether that's at the, the literal cafeteria table or in clubs or in the corporate setting with um, employee resource groups, mm -hmm. when those spaces have been provided and have the support of the organization, they actually can lead to greater engagement in that organization feeling a greater sense of belonging, a greater sense of this place is a place that cares about me and that I feel like I want to stay in and feel and make a contribution to. There's a wonderful book called Race on Campus by Julie Park, in which she talks about the fact that um, students who are actively involved, students of color who are actively engaged in affinity groups, whether that's like the Black Student Organization or the Asian Student Organization, whatever it might be, those students also tend to be the most engaged with um, cross-racially, mm -hmm. you know, because they've got a place to recharge, they come out charged up and are ready, energetic about connecting with people different from themselves. But what's interesting is the reverse is not true. Um, that white students who are sequestered in white organizations, whether that's a sorority or a fraternity that's predominantly white, um, or you know just a social network of friends that's largely white, those students tend to stay in those groups and don't branch out beyond them um, as frequently. So it is um, so the purpose of sitting together as uh, an underrepresented or marginalized group seems to have a different impact than when majority um, students are sitting together in racial mm -hmm. isolation. Mm -hmm. Very good. If that so makes sense. It does. And, you know, I, I feel as though I've also kind of discovered in conversations um, outside of the academy that sometimes those cafeteria tables exist for um, a form of validation. Yes. So that, you know, if you are the first of your kind in your work group or your department or even your organization, uh, and you are having a unique experience. And if you share that experience, again, you might face some resistance or a discounting of it. And so if you're able to connect with other people in your industry or in your organization and share what your experience is about, you know, you're not feeling as though you you are an outlier, that you are kind of alone in this and that there is something wrong with you because yeah. now you have a table of other people who can validate that your experience is real, um, that you can move through it or even learn strategies um, for how to be successful in that environment. So, you know, it, there is an opportunity for it to be really adaptive, but I think from an organizational perspective, you're exactly right. Uh, companies, colleges, universities have to use that as a vehicle for feedback, uh, 
for information, to identify high potential people for training and development for leadership positions. Um, but there has to be kind of organizational buy-in. Yes. One thing I would add to this, though, um, that I think is important, particularly in the in the school setting, whether that's K through 12, or, and typically we're talking about high school age students or, or maybe middle school, less so elementary, but the, um, but if you think about colleges and universities, when people ask the question, you know, why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? Um, usually that's during free time, right? People are sitting together during meals or, you know, just hanging out after dinner or whatever, you know, if it's a residential campus where people gather in the cafeteria or in the dining hall. Um, but they don't often ask the question, what's happening in the classroom? And I think that it's very important to say that the classroom is the place where we can really help students connect with each other across lines of difference. You can you know, structure groups where students are working in small groups together. You can give assignments where students need to pair up. You can do all kinds of things that help students connect with one another across lines of difference. And if we are more intentional about doing those things in the classroom, those, the lessons learned, the experiences gained, the friendships developed in the classroom are likely to translate outside of the classroom. But if we only focus on what's happening outside the classroom and don't think about how we use what is probably the most valuable time when students uh, come across lines of difference, which is in classrooms, um, we have, I think, missed a, an opportunity, an important opportunity. Great, that's wonderful. And you're right, I, and again, I'm thinking about workplace context that if your needs are met, if you're validated, if you feel as though you have voice and a sense of psychological safety, you know, the desire to do the, you know, my group thing at the cafeteria table or after work drinks is not as strong because you know, you've had that sense of fulfillment in your work. And so hopefully that's what everyone is able to um, accomplish. So you know, I mentioned my leadership book club um, I did in like 2019 with, with your book. Um, and the most recent edition has a 72 page prologue. And you know, I assign that for the first week. I was like, you just need to read the prologue, which you know, at the beginning sound weird until they opened the book and saw how long it was. Um, and when we met the following week, um, the group largely expressed a sense of shame, uh, disappointment in themselves. Um, maybe a, a bit of disorientation in regards to you know, how they saw themselves as allies and as progressives. Because in that 72 pages, you provide a historical analysis of the racial violence that has occurred in the country. And so oftentimes the, the discussion was around, you know, I remember being really upset when Trayvon Martin was killed, but somehow I forgot. You know, I stopped thinking about it. It, it didn't, you know, um, affect me in the same. And I just went across my life and went on with things until the next thing occurred. And then the pattern kind of repeats itself. Um, shame is, I think, a, um, a demotivating. Um, variable in these conversations of trying to promote more kind of racial reconciliation and, and discussion. How do you manage um, those expressions and, and feelings of shame that often are presented by, you know, our white counterparts? I think it's a really important question because you're right that um, no one wants to feel shamed and it is demotivating, you know, it, uh, and uh, often a source of resistance, you know, because even if you feel sad and feel some shame or guilt, that's not going to last very long. It's eventually going to turn into resentment. And that mm -hmm. resentment is kind of a kill the messenger kind of resentment. You know, if you would just stop talking about it, if you didn't make me look at these things, if you didn't assign that chapter to read, 
you know, I would be the happy-go-lucky person I was last night, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, and so there is that kind of resistance, but I think it then becomes important. I found when I was teaching um, my course that it was really important to spend some time at the beginning to just make clear that we all play a role in making it better, right? You know, as I said, you know, if you're reading about Trayvon Martin, followed by the shooting of Jordan Davis, followed by, you know, Michael Ford, you know, all the, all the names that we might mention. And even in just this period since the time of George Floyd, you know, there are more names, you know, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, um, you know, all those names that we could mention. And any, you know, unless you're the person pulling the trigger, you can say, I didn't do that, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it wasn't me. But yet people, a white person might say, people who look like me are doing these things. And I feel ashamed about that. That person can be helped to see it's not your fault, it's not my fault, but it is our collective responsibility. What could we do that would make it different? You know, we can certainly go out and protest as many people did. But after the protest is over, then what do we do? You know, do you write a letter to the editor to talk about uh, the policies around policing? You know, do we, I, I live in Atlanta and one of the things that's happened in Atlanta is that the policy around cash bail has been changed, you know, because that keeps poor people in prison even if they're not guilty, simply mm -hmm. because they don't have the money to pay the bail while they wait for their trial, um, as an example. Um, and so there are all kinds of policies and practices that people engage in without much thought that when they stop to think, we can say, this policy leads to differential outcomes. This policy negatively impacts um, people of color in ways that it doesn't affect white people. This policy makes it harder for um, kids of color to be able to go to school or thrive at school or be able to get into, you know, I mean, whatever it, whatever it is, when we look at the differential um, practices, and again, not always intended to be discriminatory, but, um, or the role that unconscious bias plays. You know, I know as someone who does organizational psychology, you know, if we look at hiring practices, we know, I mean, there, there are some great studies that show identical resumes. If, you know, if one resume says Jamal Washington on it, and the other one says, you know, Grant Davis, you know, Grant Davis is assumed, even without knowing, Grant Davis assumed to be a white guy, Jamal Washington assumed to be a black guy, identical information otherwise, all those resumes with the Grant Davis-like names on it are more likely to get called back for an interview than those resumes with the names that sound like Jamal Washington. Um, and why is that? It has everything to do with, uh, you know, it's people are sorting those quickly. This one right. sounds like the kind of person I'd like to hire. This one I'm not so sure about because of the stereotypes that are deeply embedded and the smog in the air. So what do we do about that? You know, if I'm the HR, if I'm the white HR manager and I'm aware of these ideas, um, then what can I do to reduce the likelihood of that kind of discrimination? Maybe I can take the names off. You know, maybe I can slow the process down. Maybe I can insist that every uh, set of finalists be diverse. And if for some reason, we don't have enough candidates in our pool to make it diverse. We have to expand the search until we do. Mm -hmm. There are things that we can do to interrupt this process, but only if we are taking action. But if we get immobilized in our guilt, we don't take action. So I think it becomes important to just make clear that this is a process that we all have been touched by and that we can do something about it, but only if we let go of that guilt and take just acknowledge responsibility. Right. 
And Dr. Tatum, what I really kind of appreciate about what you've shared with us today is that there is also this um, desire to do things quickly, yes. right? And that, that push to be efficient often means we are going to fall back on stereotypes and, and biases because you know, we have security in them, we're comfortable with them, and if we can make the decision quicker, then it must be a better decision. When actually we know it probably won't be a better decision and it will be you know, likely to be contaminated with all kinds of biases because we didn't allow time to process what's going on. Exactly. Speed and ambiguity are not your friend. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. So I want to shift a little bit to, to um, talk about your time after faculty life. Um, and for very um, personal reasons, since I, I have you in front of me, to just talk about your journey as a leader in higher ed. Yes. Um, so you um, retired from the presidency of Spelman in 2015. And prior to that, I believe you were um, at Mount Holyoke yes. and you know had faculty roles and interim provost there as well. And well, so, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I was just gonna, I'm happy to sort of talk about that transition, you know, from being a faculty member. I actually went from being um, a professor and chair of my department for a brief period of time to serving as Dean of the college. Um, and then from Dean of the College, I served for a brief period of, for six months as acting president. So that's the interim role that you were thinking of, I think. But, but you know, I didn't, many people asked me about how it was that I got to be a college president. And I, um, I meet young people who will tell me, I'd like to be a college president one day, you know, tell me how you did it. And I can honestly say it was not something that I set out to do. I was never one of those young people who said, I'd like to be a college president. You know, I wanted to be a psychologist. I, I enjoyed being a college professor. But after I'd been doing it for about 16, 17 years, um, my book, Why Are All the Black Kids, had just come out in 1997. I started to feel a little restless. You know, at that time, I was in my mid forties and I, uh, my kids were getting older and I was looking for a new challenge. And I started asking my fellow faculty members in the psychology department for advice. And I had a conversation with one of my colleagues who suggested that maybe the challenge I needed was to think about administration. And, and as it happened at Mount Holyoke, the position of Dean was about to become open. The person who was in the role was stepping down. And she said, I think you should be the Dean. And I said, okay. <laughs> I said, who in her right mind would want that job? <laughs> that was my initial response to that suggestion. But she said, no, really use your imagination. If you were Dean of the college, the ideas that you've been writing about, you could actually put them into practice here at this institution. Mm -hmm. And that could make a big difference here. And I hadn't really thought of it in that way. I, I thought being a Dean was just going to a bunch of boring meetings was what I really thought. And, um, and but as she said, I was not using my imagination. So when she made that I, suggestion, I did start to think about it. And I went to see the man who was the dean. And I asked him, you know, what had he enjoyed about the job? I just, you know, wanted to get some information about what was really entailed. And as I learned more about it, I decided I thought I would try it out. And as a friend of mine said, what do you have to lose? I mean, if you don't, if you, one, if you apply for the job, you might not get it. But if you do get it and you don't like it, you can always go back to being a professor. So it, in that sense, it was not a big risk. So I decided I would apply for the job. And as it turned out, I was selected to be the dean. And I quickly learned that it was very interesting, that I really enjoyed the meetings. I went, I did go to a lot of meetings, but some of those meetings I was in charge of. And I learned that if you get to set the agenda, then the meeting will always be interesting. 
<laughs> That's so, a very good point. Yes. Right. So if you have a, a value around, you know, creating an inclusive college, that is always going to be a part of the discussion. Exactly. Exactly. So I enjoyed being the dean and I did it for four years. And during that time, I started getting nominations for presidencies. Um, and for, you know, some of the folks in the audience, they may not know, but often when an institution is looking for a president, they don't just put an ad in the Chronicle. They do that, but they also ask other academics to suggest people to nominate, um, to nominate candidates. And I, people started nominating me. And so I would get these letters saying, dear Dr. Tatum, you've been nominated for this position or that position. And I wasn't really sure that I was interested in being a president at all, but I enjoyed being the Dean. And my, uh, a, a friend of mine, a mentor of mine told me that if you think you would ever want to be a college president, even if you're not sure, it might be a good idea to apply for a job just to see what the application process is like, to go through that process and um, learn more about what colleges are looking for and that kind of thing. So I thought that was good advice. So one day I got a letter from an institution that sounded like I might be interested in the job. It was located in a city where I might like to live and I thought I would explore the possibility. So I put in my application, I wrote a letter responding to the nomination and submitted the materials and lo and behold, I got an interview. And once I interviewed, um, the interview went very well and the search consultant said, you know, this search committee is very interested in you and so you need to decide if this is a job you really want because you don't want them to decide, yes, she's the one we want. And then for you to say, no, I was just exploring, right? Um, so you need to make a decision. So in that process, I decided to ask for advice and I asked the advice of three women, all of whom had been college presidents. And one of them, was a woman I knew I'd met several times at conferences and I asked her what she thought. And she said, you know, I'm not sure this is the right opportunity for you. And she said, I, I think the, and that was my question. Should I keep being the Dean here in a job I really enjoy or leave this place to go be a president somewhere else? And she said, you have teenage sons. My oldest son was a freshman in college but my younger son was a freshman in high school. And she said, you know, that's a hard time for a kid to move. You might wanna wait until he's out of high school. And then, you know, you'll be an empty nester. You can do anything you want. Um, and so I, but that was her advice. She said, you know, the presidency is a very demanding job. You might wanna wait until your son is out of high school. The second person I talked to said, I don't think this is the right job for you. I, I mean, it, you know, you might enjoy it, but I, the match between you and the institution really needs to be the right match, like finding the right partner. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that institution is the right partner for you. If I were you, you might want to wait because there'll be other opportunities. Um, but if you decide not to go forward, if I were you, I would ask the president you work for to consider giving you some new opportunities so you can keep growing in your job and you know keep learning new things right. while you wait. And then the third person was the president I worked for who was a woman and I asked her what she thought about, and I told her what my decision was and she said, I think you should stay here. Um, in part because you know I'm happy that you're the Dean. I would like you to stay here and keep being the Dean and I said, well, I'm inclined to do that for all these other reasons, you know, my mm -hmm. kid in high school and maybe it's not the right fit. Um, but she said, but I said, you know, if I stay here, what new thing could I do that I would be able to keep growing in my job? And she said something that completely surprised me, which was, she said, what you don't know is that next year I'm going to take a sabbatical. The board has agreed to let me have a sabbatical and I'm going to be away from the college for six months. If you stay here while I'm gone, you can be the acting president. And that seemed like a great opportunity mm 
because I wasn't sure I wanted to be a president, but right. if I had this six month period to kind of try out the role without moving, without disrupting my family in any way, mm -hmm. um, that would really be a wonderful opportunity. So with that as the uh, uh, carrot, you know, is that, is that the, as that as the, the idea worth staying for, I withdrew from that other search. I decided I didn't want to go any further in the interview process and I would stay at Mount Holyoke and I would serve as acting president, which I did um, because the president as promised went on sabbatical. And um, as she was leaving campus, she gave me the key to the office and she said, I bet you're gonna like it. And, uh, and I did like it. I did enjoy being the president. So in that six month period, it became clear to me that I would like to be a president. And it was during that six month period that I received a letter nominating me for the presidency of Spelman College. So it was, you know, the, that really seemed like the perfect opportunity for me. Uh, and I applied, had an interview, the rest is history. You know, I got that job and served as president for 13 years. But um, if you'd asked me in 1996, was I gonna enter administration or become uh -huh. a college president? I would have said, no way. <laughs> it wasn't on my radar at all. But what I learned from that process is, you know, you have to be open to new opportunities. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so I'm very interested because you are an expert on racial identity development, yes. that you moved from a predominantly white institution to a historically black institution and one of two HBCUs that serves black women specifically. Yes. You know, what was that journey like in regards to your own racial identity development? Yeah, I know your parents went to Howard and your grandmother actually attended Spelman, yes. but you had spent a fair amount of time immersed in the PWI world. All of my education, yes. All of your education and in your professional life. So yes. what did you learn about yourself in making that transition? Well, it's a great question. Let me start out by saying that, yes, my family history is rooted in historically black colleges. You know, both my parents went to Howard, as you said, my grandparents um, were also college educated, but at Tuskegee and, um, you know, uh, my mother's parents were uh, attended Morris College, which is in South Carolina. There were a number of, you know, I could go into family history and find a number of different HBCUs that had played a role. So it was an important part of the family legacy for sure. Mm -hmm. But I came of age, I grew up in Massachusetts in um, a small town outside of Boston. Uh, and I, I wanna tell that story for a moment too, because I think it speaks to, you know, sort of social change. Um, I was born in 1954, which is the year of Brown versus Board of Education. I was actually born in Florida, in Tallahassee, Florida. And at the time that I was born, my father, who was a college professor, was teaching at Florida A&M, uh, which as I'm sure everybody knows is the HBCU. And at the time that he was teaching, he was an art professor. He'd been an art major at Howard and he had a master's of fine art from the University of Iowa and which he got in the early 50s and now it's 1954 and I'm the second of what was then two children and um, he wants to get a doctorate so that he can advance you know in higher education right. and would have liked to do that at Florida State University but in 1954 even after Brown Florida State was still a whites only institution and remained that way until the 1960s. And um, so he couldn't go to Florida State, but the state of Florida was obligated by law following the Brown decision to provide access. Um, and so what they did in order to provide that access was to pay my father's transportation out of the state. So my dad studied for his doctorate at Penn State University in Pennsylvania and commuted back and, and forth. I would between. like to say go Lions. That's where I got my PhD, but. Okay. <laughs> so between, so he's traveling between Tallahassee, Florida and State College, Pennsylvania um, to get that doctorate. And when he finished it in 1957, my older brother was almost six and my parents did not want him to be educated in the segregated schools of Florida. 
And so my dad started looking for a job outside of the state and found a job in Massachusetts where he became the first African-American professor at Bridgewater State College, now known as Bridgewater State University. So now my parents are moving to Bridgewater, which is a small New England town, hardly any black people in it. And he's the only black professor at the university. And most of my schooling, I was the only black kid in any of my classes. Mm -hmm. So I, um, that's where I grew up, you know, from the age of four till I went off to college. And when, so now it's 1971 and I'm graduating from high school and my mother did suggest Howard, right? You know, I'm applying to college. Oh, I'm sure, yes. <laughs> and, and she certainly suggested Howard, but as part of my own adolescent identity development, I did not want to go to the same school my mother had attended, right? I wanted to go to my own school and I picked Wesleyan University, which is in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And at the time, Wesleyan had just started accepting women. It had been a male school, all, all, all men. So I was in the second class of women. So I went not only to a predominantly wow. white institution, but a predominantly white male institution. Um, but I actually had a great experience there because they were actively recruiting students of color. And while we were um, in the minority, no doubt, there was a critical mass of Black and Latinx students that became my primary social network. And it was a great experience for me. But fast forward, you know, I went to Michigan, University of Michigan, got my PhD, my master's and my PhD there. And then I was working uh, first at UC Santa Barbara, then Westfield State, then Mount Holyoke, all of them predominantly white institutions. And now I have this opportunity to come to Spelman. So um, on the one hand, it seems like an odd choice for them maybe, and maybe for me too. But on the other hand, I had been studying racial identity development of black youth. And as part of my research, I had interviewed black students at predominantly white institutions, but I had also interviewed black students at Howard. And I was particularly interested in talking to um, black students who had grown up in predominantly white communities because I was interested in their family socialization practices and what, um, how their parents fostered a positive sense of racial identity development for them, even though they were living in a majority white community. Um, I remember interviewing a young African-American woman at Howard who had grown up in a predominantly white community. And she talked about how important it was for her to be at Howard and how much pride she felt when she crossed the yard and looked around and saw the buildings and felt like this place was built for me. And how important that, how affirming that was for her. And when I interviewed for the Spellman job, I referenced that conversation with that young woman. And I said to me, my goal as president would be for young women who come to Spelman to be able to say, this place was built for me and it's nothing less than the best. That they don't have to choose between being at Spelman where they feel affirmed and being able to study abroad. You know, they don't have to choose between uh, being affirmed at Spelman and feeling like, you know, the library is the best it could possibly be you know, that we wanted to be sure that the experience was um, state of the art so that right. it could be both built for you and a premier experience. And that was really the goal that was driving me as, as my vision for the institution and um, galvanizing everyone else around that goal was really exciting and, um, and even though Spelman is an HBCU <clears throat> and I'd never worked at one and never attended one prior to coming to Spelman, what it was familiar to me was that it was a women's college. And I'd spent you know, 13 years at Mount Holyoke, which is also a women's college. And what might really be a surprise, what, you know, it's not obvious, but the founders of Spelman were two white women from Western Massachusetts who were inspired by the model 
of Mount Holyoke. Mount Holyoke was founded in 1837. Uh, Spelman was founded in 1881. And the founders were coming from that New England women's college culture and really wanted to re uh, replicate it in Atlanta for the benefit of black women just out of the bonds of, of slavery. Mm -hmm. And and they and they wrote about it. I mean, they kept journals which are in the archives at Spelman, and they wrote about things like you know trying to create the Mount Holyoke of the South. Um, and oh, wow. so, uh, and I was president <clears throat> number nine. This is the last little bit of uh, Spelman trivia I'll share with you. Um, but I was president number nine. President number four at um, Spelman was a woman named Florence Matilda Reed. Florence Reed served as president. She was a white woman and she served as president of Spelman for 26 years, a long time, at least, at least 25, it might've been 27, but you know, more than 20 years. And she was a Mount Holyoke graduate. So there are traditions at Mount Holyoke that are also traditions at Spelman. Oh, um, interesting. Uh, and so I think that my belief is that President Reed instituted some of the things that she remembered from her college experience during mm -hmm. that 20 plus year period that she served as president. So while on the surface, they are very different institutions, um, there are some real strong commonalities which were familiar to me and that made my transition perhaps a little easier. Definitely. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. And so we have a number of questions that have been submitted um, from the time that registration came open. And I think there might actually be a few in the chat as well. So if you have a, a few more minutes, I like to yes, turn to some time. of those Let's questions that have been submitted. Um, this is um, a great question. Um, what is the best way for me as a white teacher to open up the conversation about race with my students? I think this is a really important question because um, it is really useful for uh, white faculty um, at whatever level, you know, middle school, high school, even elementary school can do it in an age appropriate way, but certainly at the college level, how you do it will of course depend on your subject matter, right? You know, so as a psychologist, I could say, you know, I'm going to teach this course on the psychology of racism. We can spend all semester talking about it. But when I was teaching introduction to psychology, um, I found ways to build it into the curriculum. But even when I was talking about um, something like research methods, you know, psychology 101, and we're talking about the difference between a dependent variable and an independent variable. You know, well, I can use a classic experiment like um, Claude Steele's research on stereotype threat to illustrate the independent variable and the dependent variable. And so we can both talk about the content as well as the form of the experiment. You know, if I am a, a, a professor of literature, certainly there are books that I might want to teach that will have racial themes. Um, that will help us talk about the question of identity and racism and what does that mean. Um, if I am teaching sociology, you know, social groups, easy. You know, the historians, you know, plenty of material to draw upon. Um, you know, if I'm a chemistry professor, it might seem a little harder. But even in uh, the sciences like biology or chemistry or physics, we can talk about in our, in some ways, the role, you know, who does these fields? That's you right. know, where are the black women in physics? There are some, you mm -hmm. know, uh, where are the um, black female mathematicians? I, of course, I'm thinking black female because of my Spelman experience, but, you know, as we think about where are the people of color in these fields whose work may not be visible to us. Even something as simple as spelling out somebody's name, you know, we often use, I mean, if somebody reads a, a, a reference, somebody reads my book and sees the initials, B. Tatum, B.D. Tatum, 
they might think it's, you know, Bob, right? I mean, they don't right. know. It's a woman. The male default. Right, exactly. Yeah. But if it, someone has spelled it out on their syllabus, Beverly, right? Now they know, well, at least I know it's a woman, right? Um, and so we can then talk about what difference does it make in terms of the way someone thinks about a problem or how their biography informs their research. There's lots of different ways to bring the subject to the fore and how one does it is gonna obviously be subject specific, but I think it is important to do so. I wanna say one other thing, which is to say, you know, when the person asking the question says, you know, how do I as a white person do this? As in like, maybe I shouldn't do it. Maybe a person of color should do it. I think that's, mm -hmm. I think we need to understand that white students need the role models. Um, they need to see white adults speaking up about these issues because it is something that is important for all of us to do. But I, um, one of the things that I learned when I was teaching my class was that so many of my white students would say, I have not seen a white person mm -hmm. leading this conversation. I haven't mm -hmm. seen a white person interrupting a racial joke. I haven't, you know, I don't, I don't have those examples. And, mm -hmm. and everybody needs those role models. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I, I've had the experience, again, teaching in that psychology of prejudice class where one of the final assignments might be to go and identify the white allies that marched alongside Martin Luther King, yes. that worked in places like Birmingham and Nashville, yes. um, to understand that there is precedent, right? You're not doing this yes. alone. You're not the first. Um, you're not the only one. And, yes. um, and to connect with those historical figures. Um, I work a lot with the STEM community and I have a good friend and, and colleague who's um, a plant biologist. One of the things that she does is not only spell out the name of the scholars whose work she's covering, but if she can, she'll also add a picture yes. to kind of the first slide, again, to disrupt the pattern of, of assuming that, you know, all the faculty are white and male or maybe Asian. Um, yes. But that there are also other groups who are represented in this in this work. Uh, someone recently suggested that you try to identify um, more recent junior scholars um, yes. who are underrepresented, share their work, but then map backwards to yes. those who contributed to the work that's being done today. So you know, yes. STEM folks love to talk about their lineage, who their major professor was. And that person's major professor, you know, because I think oftentimes the resistance come up, comes about by, well, you have to cover X in this yes. course. If you're in, in English, you know, you have to cover Jane Austen, you have to cover Shakespeare, yes. and we can't swap that out in, in favor of more multicultural literature. Well, maybe you can if you start with the multicultural literature and trace the themes and contributions of prior prior um, scholars and, yes. and authors. So um, a great example, I think a, a great question to think about how this occurs across uh, different levels of um, education. So um, another um, question that comes up, uh, how can we help create an inclusive environment on an individual level? How can we start this change to acceptance of diversity and inclusivity. And I'm really interested um, that the author focus on individual level because, yes. you know, as psychologists, <laughs> that is often um, kind of our, our safe space to think about individual level contributors to exclusion versus inclusion when sometimes we need to think larger. Yes. But the value of the asking the question is, you know, what can I as an individual do? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I like to say is you can get in the habit of asking certain questions. And one of the questions that I think we can all get in the habit of asking is this one, who's missing from the picture? What do I mean by that particularly? It's another one of my you know, analogies. Uh, but here, let's imagine, let's imagine that we were together in an auditorium and we invited 
a large group of people to come up on the stage for a group photo. And everyone who's on the stage with us is going to get a copy of the photo when it's taken. No matter who you are, when you get your copy of the photo, you're going to do, we're all going to do the same thing, which is look for ourselves, right? That's the first thing you're going to do when you get that group photo, you're going to look at it and try to find yourself in the picture. And once you found yourself, then you're going to evaluate how you look. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, was I smiling? Are my eyes open? You know, what, how do I, how did the picture turn out? But let's imagine that group photo was taken. And before we got our copy of the picture, someone digitally removed several people. You know, maybe every 10th person got digitally removed. You can do that, uh, Photoshop. And so there was a person there, now that person's gone. When the photo's given out, we're all looking for ourselves in the picture, but some of us aren't going to find ourselves there. Some of us are going to be missing from the picture. And if that were to happen, we would say, what's wrong with this picture? But let's imagine it happened a lot. Let's imagine that every day someone's taking a group shot and every day you get a copy of the photo and you look and you're not there because once again, you've been digitally removed. After a while, you wouldn't say, what's wrong with this picture? After a while, you would say, what's wrong with me? Why is it that I keep being taken out of this picture? Or, you know, maybe I don't even know I'm being digitally removed. Maybe I'm just invisible, you know? And for some reason, the photo's going off and, you know, it's like a scene out of Twilight Zone. I'm not <laughs> showing up on this picture. Mm -hmm. And so um, if we think about, the organizations we belong to, the institutions, the classrooms, the social networks we're part of, each one of those groups is like a photo. We step into the picture, we look for ourselves in there. You know, are there people like me in this organization? Are there people like me in this meeting? Are there people like me, you know, part of this committee? Um, and hopefully we find ourselves there but some people don't. And if you are an individual in the room, in the photo, you have the opportunity to ask the question, who's missing from this picture? Who should be here, who isn't? You know, who should be part of this conversation? Who should be contributing to this dialogue? Who is not invited or hasn't been included or made to feel welcome? And what can I do about that? Mm -hmm. I think that that's um, a question that we can all get in the habit of asking. And I think it's really important to both model it as a, you know, if you're a faculty member or an administrator, how do you model that for the students who are observing? Um, right. Because they need to also learn how to do it. If we are developing the next generation of leaders, we need leaders who learn how to lead inclusively, who learn how to, um, ask those questions so that when they are in positions of responsibility, they are creating more inclusive environments and are effective leaders as a result. Awesome. And I think, you know, white professors and administrators need to kind of demonstrate this for their minority students. Yes. You know, to, to signal that there is a sense of belonging and safety here and that, you know, you're not on your own own trying to navigate these institutions, that there yes. are people who, it's more than rhetoric, but behavior. Yes. yes. Well. Speaking of which, I want to say that, you know, um, what you find in your office, right? You know, student comes for office hours, or, you know, what do they see in your office? Do they see books on the shelf that might connect to their experience? Do they see a poster? Um, advertising um, a graduate school program's efforts to recruit students of color. Do, you know, what do they do? Are there signs or um, signals that say this person has thought about people like me? Um, because sometimes those nonverbal cues send out um, a message of this is a place where you're welcome and belong, or this is a place, you know, that, I mean, heaven forbid you walk into an office and you see a poster advertising, 
you know, some white supremacist rally, right? You wouldn't want that. Um, and, uh, but so it doesn't necessarily have to be sending out messages of exclusion. But if I used to say to teachers, classroom teachers, K through 12, you know, if a parent walks in or a student walks into your room, what do they see on the walls? Do they see images that might indicate that you've thought about how to create an inclusive classroom? Those things signal to um, your audience, your constituents, what's on your minds, and it makes a difference. Right. That sense of um, ambient belonging, I guess, yes, is what the exactly. social psychologists call it. And then the opposite, though, becomes a macro microaggression. Yes. You know, you, when you walk into a school or you walk into a college and you only see the history of leadership and none of it looks like you. And that's, you know, the re repeated message that you somehow don't belong yes. or your contributions won't be, um, you know, rewarded in some way. So I, I think, you know, signaling is a great way to think about that, especially recruitment perspective, but also I think in a retention perspective as well. Absolutely. So um, a few people have submitted items related to the COVID pandemic. Um, and, you know, I think this goes back to some of our earlier conversation of, you know, what changes would you make um, to the book in light of the pandemic? So if you were to provide an, another edition, another update, what role would the pandemic play in your conversation about race? You know, that's a great question. And I, I um, my thought is, let's imagine that prologue, right? I wrote that prologue mm -hmm. um, and in it, I was reflecting on what had happened between 1997 and 2017, right? That 20 year time period. Well, fast forward, let's imagine I was writing about, you know, the time between 1997 and 2020. Um, I would of course have to include the impact of the pandemic and, you know, the George Floyd murder and the um, events, fall, the summer of racial reckoning as people have described it. But I think particularly around the pandemic, we would have to talk about the health disparities, right? You know, the impact of COVID in communities of color has been very different than in um, majority communities, particularly in urban areas. You know, and if you might say, well, what, you know, well, why is that? You know, people ask that question. Why is it? Why is it that Black and Latinx families have been so, have been more likely to die from COVID, for example? Some of that has to do with previous conditions, but those previous conditions might be very much related to things like environmental pollution, toxic right. environments, mm -hmm. um, very much related to low wage jobs where you are riding public transportation and exposed mm -hmm. in ways that you're not if you're in your own car and commuting um, or living in close quarters with multiple relatives perhaps, or you know, mm -hmm. smaller spaces or doing jobs that expose you without the appropriate protection. I'm thinking about you know the interviews I've heard of folks working in nursing facilities, not just hospitals, but nursing right. environments, you know, nursing homes, where they were having to reuse uh, their protective care because it wasn't enough to go around, or you know, just difficult circumstances leading people very vulnerable to high levels of exposure to the virus. I would certainly want to write about that and include that. Um, and, but also talking about the ways in which the impact of what's happening now, virtual learning, um, and what does it mean to be a student who is in a in home environment where maybe you don't have access to the internet or access to the technology you need to be able to um, reliably access an online learning experience as just one example. So that, you know, again, the ways in which um, race and racism intersects with um, the experience of what's happening right now. It's not happening the same for everyone. Right. 
And the pandemic certainly, um, because of the you know, existing inequities in how schools are funded across the country. Um, you know, I, a lot of my teacher friends believe that this will just exacerbate those differences, especially yeah. when families with means are able to establish pods. Yeah, you know, I have one of my best friends from college is a retired K through 12 teacher and many families are reaching out to her to say, oh, you know, will you teach, you know, this small group of kids from my neighborhood a few hours a day and supervise, you know, their schoolwork, which is largely virtual. And I think, wow, not everyone, you know, has those yeah. connections or the, you know, economics to be able to, you know, hire someone to bring to their home or even to, you know, work with their student remotely. Yes. Um, and she is not a woman of color. And so, you know, as we talked about these opportunities, I said, well, here's your opportunity to disrupt the pattern of the haves and have, have nots. You know, if you have an opportunity to teach English or history, here are some ways in which you might do it differently uh, yeah. for these kids who may never be really exposed to multicultural literature or to have a, a fuller understanding of African-American history beyond slavery. Right. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of work to be done uh, in that area. Um, and I think, you know, as the pandemic continues, we have to have those conversations. It's not enough to just sit back and say, well, this is going to end one day. Uh, mm -hmm. As you mentioned, we have to be allies and, and be more uh, progressive and, and active. So I'm watching the time. I think we probably have time for um, one or two more questions. Um, we are quickly approaching the election, yes. less than a week away. Uh, regardless of who wins, how would you like the president to lead the country in a way that we can be better connected and more inclusive um, as a culture. You know, what would that even look like? Well, the first thing I'm going to say is leadership does matter, right? So when we talk about human beings um, and our, you know, sometimes when, pe when people talk about human nature, they talk about the downside of human nature as in um, our tendency to think in us them terms, you know, to, we do tend to think, of, you know, we, we have a tendency to be kind of tribal, right, as human beings. And so to the extent that that is part of who we are, it's natural, perhaps, maybe that's the wrong word, but um, part of our, the way our brains are structured to categorize, you know, we, we categorize people, we categorize chairs, we categorize flowers. I mean, we categorize, that's how our brains are organized. We, we right. form categories. And so it is not a surprise that we categorize people and attach meaning to those categories in ways that can be problematic. And that's what racial stereotyping is about. But we also follow the leader. And so mm -hmm. if we um, have, if we know that we have a tendency, like not unlike wolves, I like to say, you know, to follow the leader. <laughs> the pack. Um, it matters what language the leader uses. So when the leader speaks in us them terms, you know, we are the good ones, they're the bad ones. Um, when a leader uses that kind of us them language, it encourages the followers to think in those us them categories. And so if the leader is defining the us very exclusively, excluding lots of people, you know, it's just us, those people are out, um, then that's what the followers are inclined to do. But if the leader says it's us, all of us, you know, defining us in a very inclusive way, um, the followers are more likely to do that as well. So we need um, a leader if we want to think, if we want to think about how to bring people together, we need a leader who uses language that is inclusionary, not exclusionary. Um, you know, without getting political or partisan, I'm not going to give any specific examples. But I think if we all look back over the last several years, 
we can come up with examples where we have seen that kind of us them language and it's dangerous you know in my book i talk about um rwanda the example of rwanda and one of the things that happened before the rwandan genocide really took off was that the leader of the country talked about the out group in very derogatory terms talked about using insect like terms you know re referring to people as uh, dehumanizing groups using dehumanizing language referring to people as animals or insects and when you use that kind of language it encourages dehumanizing followers to think in those ways right and so that's really problematic so to come back to your question what do i hope i hope that we will see language coming from the leader, whoever it turns out to be, that is encouraging empathy, encouraging um, us to put ourselves in each other's shoes so that we can think empathically about how to solve the problems that are facing us. You know, that we're not blaming other people, but we are empathizing with other people trying to understand things from their point of view in a way that leads to um, collective problem solving for the common good. Great. And then, you know, I, I have seen more and more business related articles talking about the role of empathy in yes. leadership that you yes. know, it's a, a core skill that perhaps we've understudied and not recognized um, as much. So my, my last item for you, Dr. Tatum, um, is um, one, you know, psychologist to psychologist, um, because we're dealing with such a challenging period in our country's history because of the pandemic, because of the ongoing um, incidences of racial violence and subsequent unrest because of the volatile nature of the current political climate, how are you taking care of yourself? How are this you is, safeguarding yes. your own resilience so that we can all model it? Well, this is a great question and, the, and, um, and it is so necessary. You know, we all need to practice self-care, manage our stress. It's a stressful time. I don't know anyone who isn't experiencing this election season as stressful. And um, not to mention the pandemic going on right. for months Everything. and months and months. Yeah. <laughs> And I like to say, make deposits. So what do I mean by that? You know, if you find yourself feeling like you have lost stuff, withdrawn, you know, as a friend of mine once said, if you make a lot of withdrawals, you better make a lot of deposits. So if you are um, doing activities that leave you feeling drained of energy, then you have to find ways to redeposit it. Um, and for some people that might be sitting quietly listening to some good music. It might be reading a good book. It might be taking a walk. It might be Zooming with a friend. You know, we're all on Zoom probably way too much, but I yes. find that when I, when I Zoom with an, a friend who doesn't live nearby and get caught up on her news and my news, it feels mm -hmm. like a deposit. It doesn't feel like a drain on my energy. Mm -hmm. um, I also think it's important to turn off the social media, right? I um, am active on Twitter. I post things, I read other people's posts, but I sometimes get to a place where I have to say, I'm turning this off now. You know, uh -huh. I can't look at it anymore because it is stressing me. Mm -hmm. So I think being able to just stop, silence the screens, and to do something different, completely unrelated, um, is important. Whether that's you know cooking a good meal or taking a walk or um, you know doing a jigsaw puzzle, right. <laughs> you know just but being able to turn a little bit of it, turn the noise down. Excellent. Really. I think those are great lessons for all of us. 
Um, again, I just want to extend my appreciation um, of your time this afternoon, but also your body of work, uh, because it has been so instrumental in my own scholarship, that of my students over the years, but also the you know, psychology community. And you've been such an excellent um, role model as a woman of color in psychology that has not always appreciated um, the cultural, racial, gendered lens that we offer to our science. So again, thank you for all that you've contributed. Well, I um, want to thank you for this wonderful conversation. It's been a delight and uh, congratulations to you on your new role at UAB. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And thank you to uh, the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion and all of the sponsors for this afternoon's event. Um, most importantly, I also want to acknowledge the audience over 1,100. Um, I appreciate you kind of investing this time, um, not only in your own personal development, but the development of your communities, uh, the state, and the country. So thank you, and I hope everyone has a good night. Stay safe. Good night, everyone.